personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. Now, Sam, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to come right out with it. I think the Gonzalez flag is our coolest, America's coolest historic flag. It's got, it's got my favorite kind of political message on it. It ties right back to the foundation of Texas. Uh, there's a sweet cannon on it, which I think most people today would mistake for a vaporizer pen. And uh, I like that it's gray and black. I like that it's gray and black. It's not trying too hard. It's a very, it's a very subtle, chic, uh, almost almost modern looking flag. I feel like if a PR team tried to sit down and come up with a Pro 2A flag, it would look just like this. Yeah, it's a nice little. It's a nice little flag. Um, I also, you know, love the um, the come and take it is cool because it's not. It's not um, abstract, you know, as we'll no. get in, it's very specific and we will get into that. And I'm not going to spoil the whole thing by telling you what is specific about it, because I think it's better to kind of tease that out through the context of it. But we all know come and take it, uh, which, you know, you see on pickup trucks and T-shirts and everything. Uh, it's a updated version of the classic Spartan refrain which I believe is pronounced Molon Labe. Is that, I've never, I've, I've mm-hmm. seen it, but I've never pronounced it. Yeah, that's it. Which means come and take them, um, which for those of you who have not read um, the histories or seen the 300, uh, the story behind that is that allegedly the story is that when um, the Persian army showed up for the battle of Thermopylae, against the Spartans, the first thing that they said to the Spartans was Spartans lay down your weapons and the commander, um, King Leonidas, was that who the king was of the Spartans? He was the king of Sparta. Yeah. Yeah. Um, his response was Spartans or Persians come and take them. Um, which actually, interestingly, I have been told though, I don't speak Attica Greek, so I can not verify this personally, but I have been told that, the translation that the that come and take them is the literal translation and that if you speak at it greek it actually translates as something much closer to over my dead body interesting which is another variation of the come and take it uh, It, yeah i mean it's, it's the same kind of idea but i've been told that yeah it translates um meta because it's a it's a it's not actually a um it's an idiomatic phrase, as I believe, that that is much closer in substance to over my dead body than come and take them. But um, hmm. Attic Greek speakers, hit me up at Sam Jacobs, 1776. Let me know if I'm just totally out to lunch on that one. Uh, I would love to hear more about it. But we all know this phrase because, you know, that's come and take it. Uh, if if uh, if. Uh, if I have an AR-15 and you think I shouldn't have one, well, your move. Yeah, it, it it demands that they do a little introspection. They often ask, "Are you are you willing to die for your uh, for your rights?" But now they have to wonder if they're willing to die to deprive you of them. Yes, precisely that. Uh, I, I think it I think it wonderfully encapsulates that whole notion of a free armed people who are not looking for trouble, but are also not going to take any trouble. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's what we uh, all kind of want to go for in this area, whether we're conservatives or libertarians, patriots, constitutionalists, uh, anarchists, no matter how we kind of, you know, define ourselves. I think that that's the one thing that we all more or less agree on A, a note before we proceed, I will be attempting to refer to the colonists of Texas as Texians, which was what they were called at the time. 
Um, sometimes were also called Texicans. They were generally not, they would generally not have referred to themselves as Texans as we would today. And I believe that heritage Texans may still throw around the terms Texican and Texian, though I could be wrong about that. My source for that is the film Giant with James Dean. So not the most reliable source of information, but um, they do it in Giant. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. The the takeaway is ammo.com would never try to offend a Texan. I, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I've never, I've never met a Texan I didn't like. Um, I've, not traveled in Texas extensively. I've been in Amarillo for a day. I've been in Austin for a day. I've been in San Antonio for a day. Um, you know, I haven't done a whole lot there, but I've, I've, I love Texas. I mean, Texas to me is like the most American of American states and God bless them for being so. The, our story begins in 1831. The Texians are in Gonzales, which is uh, a part of Mexico at that time. And they wanted a cannon from the federal authorities of Mexico to defend themselves from raids against the Comanche. Is that Comanche or Comanche? Do you know? I always call them Comanche. I don't know what they prefer to pronounce it like. Yeah. Sorry if there's any Comanche or Comanche listeners who do not like our mispronunciation of your tribe. We did our best. Uh, the cannon itself was not a good cannon. Uh, they, they were trying to get no. It was said by a historian name of Timothy Toddish, I believe that's pronounced, that it was not good for really much of anything but starting horse races. The it, the the main reason to have the cannon there was to have a cannon there to say, "Hey, look, Comanche, Comanche, we have a cannon, so don't come here." Um, it was visual deterrent more than a military deterrent. And so Gonzalez was one of the communities, actually, if you can believe this, that was pro-Mexico. Um, they were not an independence community. This was even after Mexico uh, started mistreating its Texians or the Texans felt that they were being mistreated by the Mexican government. And they remained loyal to Mexico. Um, the town officially declared their allegiance to Mexico and Santa Ana. But on September 10th, 1835, a Mexican soldier beat a Texian from Gonzales, and that was kind of their Boston uh, massacre. As far as I know, nobody died. He just got snot beaten out of him by a Mexican soldier, and they were not happy about that, as you can imagine. And then the federal government says, well, we better go get that cannon, or they're going to shoot this useless cannon at us. So they send off Colonel Domingo de... Ugartekia, I fan, I I butchered that, but uh, he sent out his he I'm uh, sorry he dispatched Corporal Casimiro de Leon and five soldiers of the Second Flying Company of San Carlos de Paras. My Spanish pronunciation isn't good. You guys can laugh at it, make fun of it. I'm not bothered by it. Please, by all means, make sport of my mex of my pronunciation of Spanish words. <laughs> the there were other states in Mexico that were in open revolt at this time. And so the Texians just said, well, why are we going to give you this cannon back? And so they took the guy hostage with the whole military <laughs> unit, which, yeah, it's hilarious to me. Uh, I don't know what went wrong, people, but that's really funny to me that they took them as hostages. Um, and good for them because they're uh, they're building a free nation and uh, they're, you know, resisting tyranny. So I'm not going to criticize it. Really wasn't about the cannon, though, as it wasn't about the cannon when they requested it in the first place. The issue is that they didn't think that it was going to stop at the cannon. They thought they were going to take the cannon, and then because of the uprisings, they were going to disband the local militias and disarm the population, which, you know, is a way bigger deal for them than it is for me and you, because we're not dealing with Indian raids on a regular basis, you know. And I'm not poo-pooing, I'm not going into the FUD territory of, oh, you don't need all that. But I do think that we should take a minute and reflect on the urgency of the need of the Texians to arm themselves. And that it's not just fear of a tyrannical government in some kind of abstract way because there's open rebellions and this, this kid, you know, the guy just got beat by a soldier. There's that. But, you know, the whole... Um, 
notion that they were going to be disarmed was not, you know, they're not going to go, oh, that sucks. We don't have any guns. They're going to go, oh, we're going to die now because the Comanche have not given up theirs. So they buried the cannon in the peach orchard of a man named George W. Davis. And they did this and delayed the arrival of 100 Mexican dragoons. In addition to that, um, dragoons are what? Like guys on horseback with a rifle and a sword, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, I believe they were a contemporary cavalry unit. So by the time they got there, the Texians had 140 uh, member militia and uh, you know, outnumbering the Mexican troops. The men voted on October 1st, 1835 to fight for the cannon. They just said, and it wasn't even necessarily that they were going to, that they were going to start the fight over the cannon, but they just said, we're not giving it back. And if you come and if you try to come and take it, um, you will be in fact trying to come and take it. You're going to be working at it, which I think is, 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 um, I think the interesting part of that is that much like other criminals, tyrants like low hanging fruit and they're much more likely to go pick on somebody who's not going to fight back than somebody who is, especially somebody who's armed to the teeth. And I suppose I would, or sorry, I would imagine rather that, um, you know, this factored into their decision-making that they, they, they did the math on, you know, maybe we can avoid a fight by telling them that they're going to have one if they show up, because if we don't, then they just think we're like every other pushover out here in Texas. But if we are very clear to them from the beginning that any attempt to take this cannon will require force and such force will be met with force, uh, maybe he will, maybe Santa Ana will go find somebody else to bother. I'm sure that the calculus on that was, uh, was, was discussed. That's such a foundational philosophy. Just, you know, having the army is, uh, a good guarantee you'll never need it. As he says, as uh, Clarence Worley says in True Romance, if this experience has taught me anything, it's that it's better to have a gun and not need it than need a gun and not have it. Yeah. If you want uh, peace, prepare for war. Speak uh, softly and carry a big stick. Much like Teddy Roosevelt, I, I rarely speak softly, but I do keep that thing on me. The Gonzalez flag, you may not have seen it before. And if you have, you probably didn't know what it was. You probably just thought, I mean, a lot of these, like you, you, you see them, you just think it's some variant on Gadsden and you don't think much of it, but it's a cool story. And I think people should know it. Um, it's a black and white banner. It's just a, it's just that uh, cannon and a star and, and the updated Spartan slogan, come and take it. And that was not, you know, they're not reaching into the uh, primal, archetypes of human consciousness for this these guys all know the story of the battle of thermopylae inside and out mm -hmm. yeah there's no heraldic tricks at work here no they're just connecting right right to that which is so cool because the whole reason that we have this civilization in which we currently live and the freedoms that we enjoy I do not think, and I put, I do not think it's an exaggeration to say this. I put myself very firmly in the camp of people who say that if 300 guys had not given their lives on a mountain in Thermopylae, that we would not be where we are today, simply because the Asiatic despotism of the Persians is in such stark contrast to the individual, the the Apollonian individually focused um, philosophy of the Greeks, whereby any man who is, is able to fight for the uh, body politic has a say in the decisions that it makes. And that is a very small group of people mind in ancient Athens. Ancient Sparta did not have any kind of democracy, but um, they did have the notion of the individual and the importance of the individual over that of the collective and 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 
the state is not really the right word, but let's call it the sovereign, you know, that the indiv- that the individual has an importance that's separate from the sovereign and that you don't just exist to be a tool of your sovereign is mm-hmm. an idea that is the kernel of the civilization that we have today and <clears throat> would have been crushed and snuffed out had the Persians been able to win that battle and had not been had they not been delayed by the 300 at Thermopylae. So I, they, and, and they know, you know this. It's, it's amazing because the battle of Thermopylae really demonstrated the superiority of, of, you know, personal autonomy, just the way you're describing it. Cause these were 300 guys facing an army that's been estimated into the millions by Herodotus, probably not that many, but they were all fighting for their land, for their families, for the property, for the rights, for the continue, you know, for the right to continue to exist. But Xerxes' army was pretty much made of slaves yes. and guys who were being driven forward at the end of a whip. And, you know, the, the, the problem with mercenary soldiers and much more so with slave soldiers is they, they really have nothing at stake. Victory right. to them is going to look the same as defeat. Um, so it's just such a, such a microcosm of ideals fought in the, in the peninsula then. Yeah, that's 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 really well said, and I think a really important point to make that the victory and uh, defeat do not look any different to the majority of the Persian army, but it looks a hell of a lot different to every Greek soldier. And so it is, I think, probably, I mean, I think that we can kind of put that on what's going on in Texas. You know, I don't, I can't imagine that that many of the enlisted men would have had much skin in this game. I think the officers probably would have been had, you know, that the victory or defeat matters to them, not just because of their career, but because of, you know, what it means for the nation of Mexico and um, Mm -hmm. the consequences that it will have for them beyond simple victory or defeat in this battle. Um, But it, that's, it's nowhere on the level that the guys are of, of, um, uh, of Gonzalez have it on because for them it's fight or die. So very, yeah, it's, it's a very overlapping ideals. Again, it's almost like history repeats itself, but I don't think anyone's ever said that before. No one's ever said that before. Mark Twain said it. No, that's just who you attribute any, any <laughs> quote that you've heard that you don't know. It goes to Mark Twain. Um, yeah. Best, the worst winner I ever saw was summer in San Francisco. Very true, but sadly Mark Twain didn't say it. The Texians did not wait to be attacked, which I'm, I, this is like, this is my objection to the NAP, the non-aggression principle, like in a nutshell right here is like, well, there's a bunch, bunch of, uh, goons from Mexico city from San, you know, Santa Ana has dispatched up here to kill all of us, but they haven't actually aggressed against us yet. So let's just wait till they do and then respond. No, sometimes mm-hmm. preemptive violence is the is the way to go. I'm not encouraging anyone to do this, by the way, particularly against the United States government or any of its arms. I would never encourage anyone to break the law on this show. I am simply pointing out that from a, a philosophical perspective, that waiting for an enemy to attack you who tells you that he's going to attack you is foolish, and that there are many, many, many people in this country who openly tell you that they plan to take your stuff and kill you. And that, um, you know, I don't think that we need to wait for them to aggress against us before we begin looking at ways to use the levers of government against them. I know some people out there would consider that to be a contradiction in terms. Um, I, I, I'm going to chalk that up basically to our priors being wildly different, but I think that at, at the base, you kind of get what I'm saying that like, you know, aggression doesn't begin when the fist hits your face. Aggression can begin when a guy calls you in the middle of the night and tells you that he's coming to punch you in the face tomorrow. And that, <laughs> and that you know, responding to that by going to his house and punching him before he can punch you, um, you know, I, I, is it violence? Yes. Is it is it unjustified violence? I would say no. Um, so they don't wait for the attack. They go on the offensive. They use the cannon. But they didn't have cannonballs, so they just are using <laughs> sc- scrap metal and shooting that Ooh. at this, which that doesn't sound too fun to get hit with. Uh, no, I wouldn't like that at all. 
<laughs> uh, there was a War of 1812 veteran named James C. Neal who was given command of the Texas's first artillery regiment. The assault was blessed by a Methodist minister who invoked the spirit of 1776, and the Texians swore loyalty to the Mexican Constitution of 1824, which Santa Ana had repudiated in favor of greater centralized control. I think that what's interesting to me about this is that much like the American Revolution, they're not just inventing some new idea out of nowhere that is convenient for them at the time. They're saying, no, we had a constitution in 1824. We liked it just fine. And then this guy, Santa Ana, came along and changed all the rules. And we believe that this new constitution is a violation of our rights. We would be happy to live under the 1824 constitution. Um, I think you see echoes of the American Revolution kind of everywhere in the Texas Revolution. And this is one of them. Um, an, a, an interesting parallel to the American Civil War, war between the states, war of northern aggression, however you term, however you choose to term it is that the commanding officer of the Mexican forces that attacked the Gonzales fort was also in favor of restoring the 1824 constitution. But much like um, General Robert E. Lee, he considered his first duty to be as a soldier. And so much as Robert E. Lee was not a proponent of slavery and was um, critical of the institution from a certain perspective that was different from abolitionism, to be sure, but was he was critical of the institution of slavery, uh, but he felt that his duty was to the state of Virginia, and that's who he fought for. And much the same, this commanding officer felt that his duty was to Mexico and not to these guys who were trying to restore the Constitution and the ideals that were embodied by that. It's not a perfect overlap with Robert E. Lee, but I do think that there's some parallels there, there that are interesting and worth kind of mentioning. Um, this was a minor battle. It was only a few hours. They did force the retreat of Mexican forces. Two of the soldiers died. There was one Texan casualty, and he was thrown from his horse, and he got a bloody nose. That was the only... Texan casualty, which is pretty awesome. Is what a what a way what a way to start things off. You clap two of theirs, and you make them retreat, and you got a bloody nose, and that's all you got. It was yeah. I've seen uh, it's like the same outcome of a lot of elementary school classes, minus <laughs> the the death. The uh, that was, but the thing about it, why it's stor- historically significant, is that. This was the moment when there was no going back. There was no negotiating with the government. There was no coming to a common agreement. There was no, we're going to bring the 1824 constitution left. It was, now we're in open rebellion against the federal government. Now it's real. And there's no, and there's no turning back after that. Uh, no business as usual after that. Word spread quickly throughout the United States. It was known first as, the fight at Williams Place uh, was kind of how people would refer to it. But in the American press, they would refer to it as the Lexington of Texas because the, um, the, the political situation in the United States, we should talk a bit about this, okay? So who are the Texians? They're Americans for the most part. Uh, they're Americans who left America because there was land out West and there was freedom out West. They were not they were spent decades more or less unmolested by the central government of Mexico not a lot of people in Texas at that time this whole like stolen land from Mexico thing um you know because that's the the narrative uh the the liberal narrative of history uh there was not a whole lot of people living there and most of the people who lived there were uh, Americans you know, or children thereof. I mean, that was the most of the people living out there to the degree that there was a heck of a lot of people living out there. Anyway, it was pretty sparse. Mm -hmm. It's not a very nice place to live if you don't have central air conditioning. (laughs) So there's a lot of sympathy for the Texians, even among people who are bitterly opposed to annexation, which is 
already starting to enter the political discourse in the country around that time. And even if you're not a gung-ho, let's take over Texas and add it to the union and grab Cuba while we're at it kind of guy, you certainly don't want the Mexican government to win. You want the Texians to win because, you know, there are cousins. It's like Russia and Serbia. You know, it was that kind of relationship. People felt very, very tied to Texas, even if they didn't know anybody who lived there or anything. It was just, these are our people. These are our, our brothers. And so Americans were um, very excited about what had happened because it's the Lexington of Texas. We're doing it again, boys. So a lot of Americans, younger American men, after this battle, go to Texas, partly because they want to get land, partly because the revolution's coming and they want to help from a, you know emotional or ideological perspective, and partly because of a combination of those two phenomenon as they work together that like, who do you think they're handing out land to after the revolution's over? Guys who fought in it, and, and which is, you know, as it should be, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, so that gives them that dog in the race that you want your soldiers to have. Yes, exactly. Skin in the game. That's what I'm about, people. Skin in the game. That is such a uh, important thing to me, and that that it's very much lacking from our political culture today. Or anybody who can limp over the line of their 18th birthday is allowed to decide whether or not we go to war in this country. I've spoken on this before. Mm-hmm. There's no real need for me to to kind of unpack it again. Uh, but the Texians could not back down at this point and it's good they got all the americans in helping them uh stephen f austin stone cold stephen f austin was kind of the first among equals as far as it goes with texians he is known as the father of his country after the battle uh is he still considered the father of texas you're not from texas so you don't know so like google tell me it says that the father of Texas is Beto O'Rourke when I Google. Uh, <laughs> but Duck Duck Go told me that it's Stephen F. Austin, so we'll go with that. And he was, you know, the George Washington of, of Texas. The Texan militia unanimously elected S- Stephen F. Austin as their leader. Um, yeah, people. Uh, militaries elected officers through most of this country's history. True story. Google it. It's a very interesting thing. Um, I don't think it would work anymore because we're so stupid and weak. But when we were not quite so stupid and weak, I think it it, it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, in as much as we won more <laughs> we won more wars than we lost, and you know I think that, that it worked well because these. For the most part, this is not this is not going to be your first rodeo, even if you'd never been in a quote unquote battle before. You'd you'd at least fought some Indians, probably. So you probably had developed a good sense of who was going to lead you to death and who wasn't. And Mm. I I think that's probably why it worked. I'm not suggesting that we reinstitute it because I don't I don't think it would work today. But uh, in the 1900s, when we were a slightly more serious country. It seemed to work just fine. They did it during the first couple of years of the Civil War. I think this. I think it was during the Civil War that they discontinued the practice, but it was very, very common. And if you read through history of the United States and the United States military, you will find that electing officers, that that allowing um, enlisted men to elect their officers is the norm. Particular. I mean, at least through the first half of the 19th century. So. Um, Interesting, and it seemed to work pretty well, but I, I'm not suggesting that we go back to it. The uh, and, and again, like, yeah, they unanimously elect Stephen F. Austin because it's the, they're not going to, you know, name uh, Beyonce as their uh, as their commanding officer. Uh, by the way, people, I don't have any particular axe to grind with Beyonce. I've just decided that she's going to be my shorthand for stupid pop culture obsessed irony poisoned. Um, America that thinks that, you know, the, the Marvel cinematic universe is our foundational religious text or something. Um, no shade. She might be a brilliant Beyonce. tactician. You could be totally unfair to her. It's true. I would be, uh, if I'm in the wrong, Beyonce at Sam Jacobs, 1776 <laughs> and telling me all of, 
all of your your battlefield your battlefield glories. <laughs> so Gary, this is probably your top priority right now. <laughs> and it's Jay Z's in the other room right now, like like firing up his order on ammo.com forward slash podcast, where you can get twenty dollars off any order of two hundred dollars or more from our website. Uh, telling his wife not to listen to this episode when he takes a look at my cartoon graphic on Twitter and is like, I, I'm going to lose her if she sees this guy. Um, <laughs> I can't even oh tell if this goodness. is amusing to anybody but us. But this, this, this Sam Jacobs is going to steal my wife. I assume they're married. Beyonce. Yeah, I mean, anyway, Beyonce is, is, my, is, my, uh, is my shorthand for everything's stupid about this country and it's not really meant it's more of a more of a critique of her fans than beyonce herself oh i just i remembered i looked up the names of beyonce's kids because i remember what are they sir Rumi, and blue ivy i remember blue ivy the other two i don't know man i just people should name their kids stuff like john and adam and michael and it's gotta be awkward referring to your little kid as sir God, I didn't even think about that part of it. Yeah, that's... Sir, stop picking your nose in church. <laughs> yeah. Um, name your kids' real names, people. Is that, that, that should be your takeaway from this. So Stephen F. Austin is elected as, their, as the leader of the entire militia. Um, he didn't have any military training, weirdly, but he did lead them in an assault, and they did win. So... Maybe maybe you don't need it. Maybe there is a future for Beyonce as an elected uh, military officer. By the end of 1835, they had basically won the war. Pretty much all of the Mexican forces had been driven out of the country. No one knows what happened to the cannon, which is kind of a weird thing. That no one knows what happened to it. There's, I mean, it's not even like it's gone and we know. It's nobody bothered to write down or we lost it or whatever it was. But the words on the flag, whether you like the flag or not, you've definitely heard that phrase whether you've seen the flag or not you definitely have seen that phrase um i like the flag I, it's not it's not my favorite like it is yours i'm a, I'm a gadsden guy you know like i just i love my gadsden flag um it's got a it's got a cool snake on it but i think this yeah. is this is if i was gonna pick a second this might be it uh, this one i just i like the simplicity of it and i like uh i like it's duller more muted subtler colors i think if you uh didn't want to draw the same kind of attention to yourself that the Gadsden would. This would make a fine addition to any front lawn. And we usually don't flog our flags on these flag-centric podcasts. But I do want to point out we uh, we sell all these on ammo.com. You can order any flag that Sam and I yap about, along with some ammunition, of course. Yeah, and that ammo.com forward slash podcast discount, as far as I know, is like any order of $200 or more. It doesn't necessarily have to be ammunition. I think that when I do my little rap at the end of our podcasts, I tend to say uh, you know, orders of $200 of ammunition or more. Um, if, you know, if I'm wrong and whatever, but like I'm, I'm fairly certain that that discount applies to everything on the site. It's just that the order itself has to be over $200. If I'm wrong, mm-hmm. sorry, please do not write in and complain because I think that that, that do you know offhand? No, I don't know if the discount applies to our t-shirts, ammo cans, and flags, and magazines, and patches. But I would be shocked to my core if our uh, if if we didn't honor the discount. If you just wanted to buy ten come and take it flags, yeah. So we're not promising that, but I think it works. But if you get there and it doesn't work for the flag, you know, grab yourself two hundred bucks worth of ammo and throw the flag in afterwards, and you basically just got a free flag anyway. Um, so yeah, nobody knows what happened to the cannon. In the 80s, somebody did the flag with an M16 on it, which is kind of cool. Uh, they w- were waving the banner at a Bill of Rights rally in Arizona. It's a cool modern update to it, particularly given how f- terrified liberals are of um, black guns and uh, and you know painting on black. And it's a it can now uh, host a. Uh, chainsaw attachment though i think it was you told me that you actually can now get a chainsaw attachment for an ar i have seen that in addition to the to the tactical axe and the tactical tire tire popper yeah but uh i don't i don't know i can't I would like a bayonet i do think bayonets are pretty cool but like well bayonets are practical is chainsaw silly. is going to get jammed up the first time you use it and uh 
don't know. If you need a chainsaw, just get a chainsaw. Yeah, and it also, like, yeah, I mean, zombies are attracted to noise. You start running that chainsaw, and you're going to have a whole whole bunch of zombies around in no time. So maybe just get a bayonet, people. Uh, the In 2002 the was the first appearance we are aware of of the appearance of the flag with a Barrett uh, 50 BMG rifle on it, which I'm going to look at right now and tell you if I think it's cool or not. Um, no, I don't. No, I can't see it. But anyway, um, we have the original with the cannon on it at our website, which, you know, as you say, like, if you're not, if you're like, and I get it, like, you know, you live in, you live somewhere and there's a lot of liberals around and they've been told that, you know, the, the Gadsden flag is, is actually the, the Nazi flag and you just don't feel comfortable putting it up at your house. You know, this is not a, uh on 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 uh reasonable concern of yours but a great substitute for it is that is that gonzalez flag you know with with the cannon with any kind of gun whatever um if you want you know if you're a tyrant and you want to take people's guns away it's probably not going to be easy and that's the lesson throughout history and this gonzalez flag is just one of the many stops on that so again ammo.com forward slash podcast twenty dollars off any order of $200 or more. Once again, my name is Sam Jacobs. For Dave Trello, this has been the Resistance Library Podcast, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.